trust on the internet. Uh, my name's Louise Bennett. Um, I chair the BCS Working Group on Identity Assurance o over the internet, and I'm very lo much looking forward to chairing this discussion. I'm joined today by um, Andy Smith, um, a security specialist, another member of the BCS Working Group, and he's done all the hard work of pulling uh, this workshop together for the UNIGF. We also have Professor Ki Chang Kim um, from Open Net Korea, uh, the joint organizer of the workshop, uh, Sarah Wynne Williams from Facebook, and we'll be joined about halfway through the, this uh, workshop by Professor Hong Zhu, uh, Professor of Law from Beijing Normal University. Unfortunately, she's on two panels, and the two panels have been arranged on nine o'clock on the first day. So she's speaking there first, and when she's finished speaking there, she'll come and join us. So, so she'll be here for the discussion. We also have um, Ian Fish from the BCS Working Group, who's going to be acting as our experienced remote moderator. Um, the agenda, uh, I'll give a very brief uh, introduction to the work we've done over the last three years on this very vital topic as we see it. Um, then we'll break the workshop into two discussion periods of 40 minutes each, um, introduced by short inputs uh, from the panel members to stimulate the debate. The first one is going to cover the use of identity as currency on the internet and how to protect the naive from themselves and preventing digital exclusion. The second one will cover the balance between security, privacy, and anonymity. And we've left that topic to the second one because we know if you bring it up at right at the beginning, everyone just talks about that and we can't talk about anything else. So um, that's how we're doing it. Finally, I'll try and summarize the key points of agreement and dissent um, so that we can take these topics forward in the wider internet governance debate. Um, we also hope to follow them through with a dynamic coalition. Um, for those who don't know the BCS, um, it's an international professional body for IT with over 80,000 members. It's both a training and professional standards company and a charity to promote the benefits of the information society. Um, Andy, Ian and myself uh, represent the charity as volunteers and professionals from the industry. And uh, on your places, you have uh, some notes if you want to become a professional member of the Institute. Three, three years ago, uh, the professional membership um, of the Institute um, were asked what they thought the key issues they wanted the BCS to bring to the attention of governments worldwide. And one of those was identity assurance on the internet. Um, and we've been developing uh, views on identity assurance um, at workshops since then. In the UK, um, at in Europe, at Eurodig, the European Dialogue on Internet Governance that pulls together thoughts from European countries, the European E-Identity Management Association, and at the UN Internet Governance Forum. <coughs> this work has been published in two yearbooks, and again, at your places, you have a card that shows you how to link up to those yearbooks should you wish to see them. Um, our aim is very much to ensure that we develop practical measures for improving identity governments in e-commerce and service delivery, both from the public and the private sectors, and feed these thoughts in uh, to government bodies. Moving on now to um, our first discussion session, I want to outline some thoughts on the use of identity as currency on the internet and its implications. Now, identity assurance of individuals, organizations, and increasingly things is a key issue for a successful digital economy. We need to acknowledge uh, many contradictions and strongly held opposing views that exist on the topic of identity on the internet and work out how to resolve them. We want to consider how to develop valid incentive models um, that would make the various stakeholders that exist want to participate in, in, an, in an identity governance framework. 
finally, we need to understand how this might work across very different jurisdictions because the internet is global. Now, there are many models operating in the digital economy. By models, I mean business models. And one of the most contentious is the monetization of personal data attributes on the internet. We all of us here know that some services are free or below cost. There are many reasons for this as far as companies are concerned. A common one is because the company decides they want to build market share by attracting customers to either useful or enjoyable, free cost or low services. There is value though in the data that you as a customer give when you use those sites or services. In return, you are often targeted with advertising or you may be sold add-ons to say an online gaming experience and I think this is quite common in uh, uh, Asian countries. This is really step one in monetization of your identity. Since organizations are collecting and aggregating our data in this way, it's very important that we all recognize that truth. And I'm always surprised how many people don't believe that's really happening. And on the cautionary side, some people will say, um, if you're using a free service, you're not a customer, you're a product. So we could call the aggregation of personal data the productization of people. Identity becomes currency. Now on the left-hand slide of this slide, keep that one. On the left-hand side of this um, slide, um, we have what we, I would call the onion rings of data and information um, that may be associated with an individual. Starting on the inside, um, we have um, what I would call what you are. These are your biological attributes, your fingerprints, your face, your voice, and so on. Now, these are fairly immutably bound to you. And using these biometrics is a pretty good proof um, that you are linked to your biological identity. And such data is frequently collected for government IDs and their associated entitlements because governments need to know that you're a citizen of their country. Um, in the next ring, we have um, perhaps what you could use to call what you have, and it includes things like your passport and its number. In the online context um, for secure activities, you may use your credit card, an ID card, or a company card, and you may have to present this token, um, what you have, via a device, say to pick up a one-time code for a fi financial transaction over the internet. And that's fairly secure. The person who has uh, the token uh, is probably, maybe, the person um, who's uh, entitled to use it. Now, in the outer ring, this is where I really want to focus, um, there are much less concrete things. Um, and they are what I would loosely call what you know. But more importantly for this discussion, um, it's what is known about you. Um, it's your biographical footprint, your school and your social history. Um, knowing these attributes, you can answer questions to supposedly verify your identity, like what is your favorite sport? Um, however, lots of people and organizations can know your biographical footprint. They may be your friends and family, but increasingly, Strangers can find out your biographical data from social networks and by tracing your online history. Uh, all the things that you've told companies in order to get those lovely freebies um, to read their magazines, uh, in online searches, or in your tweets will add up to your ele electronic biographical footprint. This means that strangers, um, corporations, governments, and criminals can discover your identity through your personal data attributes. You can actually easily legally observe where someone um, who doesn't turn off geolocation tweets from, for example. You can deduce from that their workplace, uh, their home, their favorite football club, 
shops, restaurants, their children's schools, and so on, an enormous amount of data. Most of us give this attribute data information away when we interact on the internet without even realizing it. Companies are storing that data and monetizing it to give us superficially free services, be they access to social networks or search company algorithms, or money off vouchers. By and large, we want these apparently free or subsidized services and are prepared to put up with sometimes invasive advertising that might be associated with them. The internet, though, is not a free resource. It costs money to build and maintain it. The question is, are you happy to help fund the internet with your identity attributes? You need to realize you're doing so and accept that if that's what you want. Now, many of these free services are harvesting and using your identity attributes as currency. Um, and these free services are often uh, the people's incentives to, to go online in the first place. Uh, I recall talking to several young people at the UNIGF two years ago in Nairobi, and they all told me that they use most of their disposable income on their mobile phones. Such things as the money service in PESA and social networks were the actually their key incentives to have a phone. Um, and if costs were kept low because the suppliers used their personal data and tracked them, they weren't concerned about it at all. And that's fine. For other people, the incentive to go online may be to buy and sell things. Um, many individuals are very happy to build up a reputation score on an auction site like eBay. Uh, to ensure that they have a reputation as a trustworthy person to do business with, irrespective of whether they're using their root identity or an anonymous eBay identity. Again, that's their own choice under their own control. I would suggest to you um, that this is quite different from such organizations as Google, and maybe there's someone from Google in the room, analyzing so-called big data without the explicit knowledge of mission of the individual and making judgments um, on the individual's part um, in the mistaken belief perhaps that they want to visit a restaurant they've been to before, they want to meet some of their social networking friends in some site because uh, the search company knows that they're somewhere nearby. We all of us need to make our own informed decisions about whether we find this acceptable and these are going to be culturally and contextually different for all of us at any point in time and over time. No one no owns the internet. No one organization or country can control it. However, we all need to understand how it works, including the business models of suppliers and the use that they will make of our identity. And this includes, most importantly, the role that our identity biographical attributes are going to play in the activities um, that we do online. And we need to decide whether we're happy about that. Um, Andy is now going to say a few words about saving the naive from themselves. How many people have um, put personal information up on the internet, on social networking sites, or uh, various other places and then regretted having done so and also find out that having put the information up on the internet it's virtually impossible to remove it again. Um, I, I, I found it quite scary um, if you know my email address from 1986 you can actually find postings I did on Usenet News in 86 and 87. They're still there and if you search for my email address on Google, you can still find them. You can't delete stuff on the internet. And time and again, we're seeing people who have done things like um, put up wonderful pictures from bachelor parties or um, other things that they've, they've done that are quite embarrassing. Um, then they go to find a, uh, a career or get a job and they suddenly find that it's a little bit more difficult than they thought uh, because, and I, I've actually worked with a couple of personnel departments in large organizations, 
who look on the social networking sites and that about prospective employees. And they uh, find some very interesting things sometimes. We, we're entering a period, and I think over the last few years, it's become uh, more and more of a problem. Um, data aggregation, uh, some people call it big data, but um, really it's the aggregation of multiple data sets that's the problem. Um, you have fantastic search tools being developed. Google are doing some brilliant work in um, heuristic mapping and, and search algorithms. But you've now got a lot of public, uh, publicly available information. Um, in the UK, we have the electoral roll, uh, which is uh, your right to vote. And unless you tick the little box to say you don't want the information being made public, um, all the information about who you are, where you live, uh, all ends up getting sold off to uh, marketing organisations and other organisations. We've got the post office address file, we've got um, various other websites that hold personal information. And if you know what to do and how to search, you can find so much information about individuals. Um, and it's everything. People uh, who are looking for jobs will put CVs up on sites like monster.com. Um, and uh, so you can get someone's address details from that from 192.com, their uh, career information from monster.com, and you can start bringing this all together and aggregating it and mining it. And it's quite amazing how much you can find out about individuals. Um, in the, the last role I was doing, um, we had subscription to a, a lot of these services. And we actually showed how you could take uh, a lady driving uh, a little red Golf, take the registration number from the car, use that against the uh, DVLA car registration database to find out uh, who she was, where she lived, what her name was, use the information the attributes we got from that to do other searches on other databases. And we, we worked out that she got two kids, where they went to school, um, who her husband was, where he went, where he worked. We, we built up a whole profile of her life just from information that was available on the internet. It's getting scary. And it's scary in a couple of ways. The biggest one is identity theft. Um, in, in previous things, uh, we've seen people filling in uh, forms online. And this can be anything from uh, applying for a tax rebate to applying for a passport to um, signing up for uh, a social network. If you've got a keyboard logger on your machine, all that personal information you're typing in uh, goes straight to the criminals and they can use it to steal your identity, misuse your identity. Um, and, and people just don't realize this is happening. You still get people will, who will go into a cyber cafe or into a local library and will fill in forms online and give away all of their personal information. People uh, uh, don't understand what the risks are and they don't understand how the risks come about. And th this is why we're on about protecting the naive from themselves. It's people who want to use the internet, want to take advantage of all the benefits on the internet, but are not tech savvy. They, they don't understand what the risks are. And we need to find a way of helping these people to understand the risks better. Not with fear, uncertainty and doubt. We don't want to stop people using the internet. We don't want to put people off using the internet. What we want to do is make sure that they're using the internet securely. And, you know, all of the things that uh, are here are actual scams, actual uh, frauds that have taken place. And trying to um, stop people uh, being taken in by these things is extremely difficult. We need to find ways of doing it better. 
and that's something that we're interested in your input on. So on that, I shall uh, we shall start the first discussion. Okay. Are there any uh, are there any questions from the audience? Well, can I pose a question to you and get some? Ah, oh, there's a question over there. Michael Nelson with Microsoft and Georgetown University. Uh, I've been working on internet issues for about 25 years. And 15 years ago, I was convinced that we should have the online identity problem tackled in four or five years. Do the panelists have any idea on why that hasn't happened? And do you have any advice for Microsoft and other companies who are trying to figure out how to make a user-friendly, privacy-enhancing, free, easy-to-use, interoperable identity infrastructure? Well, that's a <laughs> that's a that's a really good s a set of questions. Um, uh, I, I think there are many examples where companies, Microsoft included, um, and particularly the banks, have made uh, uh, online identity work, uh, but they usually only work in very specific circumstances, um, and uh, in circumstances where the user realizes that they're at risk. And that's why I think they're particularly strong in financial transactions. I know in the UK, um, uh, when online banking started, um, uh, fraud just went up and up and up. And then uh, a product called Pin Sentry came in, which was a device where you could put your credit card in, get a one-time code, and do your financial transaction. And that brought uh, initially, the uh, online fraud from about 10, 15% down to nothing. Um, and people were prepared to take that trouble because they didn't want to lose money and they didn't want the hassle of getting a new bank card. So I think if people really understand the risk in a particular situation, they are prepared to follow good procedures that people can produce for them. The big problem is that for most interactions on social network sites and so on, say buying a Microsoft product, um, you want the instant gratification of getting the upgrade. <laughs> um, and you do that without thinking about those privacy issues. But I'm sure that the others have thoughts on that. Um, I, do. Um, I just wanted to pick up on this because this, this has always been a problem and is always going to be a problem. Um, I was involved in the development of the new UK passport as part of the European um, uh, EEA passport. Um, your problem there is you need something that will work with the whole population. It's not a bunch of white men in lab coats. It's every ethnicity, every creed, every religion, um, you've got uh, 28 languages, you've got so many different parameters that you've got to deal with. Um, it's incredibly difficult. You know, biometrics will work for a lot of people, not everybody. Password will work for a lot of people, not everybody. And things like static credentials uh, just don't work uh, when you're you're dealing with organized crime and people who can record static credentials. Unfortunately, in some circumstances, fingerprints uh, and iris can also be treated as static credentials because once you've got the actual fingerprint, uh, you're, you're, uh, you can't replace it, you can't change it. Um, and trying to cater for uh, every nuance of, of um, the world we live in is, is just going to be a, an insurmountable problem. I was going to um, cover the question of identity a little bit uh, in more detail in the second half of this session. But uh, now that the question has already arisen, I would only like to point out that perhaps the problem is to uh, distinguish uh, what we need identity for. 
Uh, in other words, depending on what kind of service we are talking about, uh, if it is just some kind of uh, entertainment purpose or some sort of uh, social uh, interaction, or does it involve money being taken out of your bank account, or does it involve some kind of very valuable resources or benefits where entitlement needs to be very uh, securely or reliably de uh, determined. Um, the, the context varies very much, and then depending on the context, the very notion of identity must differ. And I think the problem is simply because we might have this preconceived notion of one size fit all, fits all kind of identity. And I think that approach is not going to work, and we need to accept that there could be many different types of identity which are simply being floated around. And it seems, in my view, the situation will be quite fluid for uh, some more uh, period of time. Do you yourself have a, a, an answer to your question? <laughs> I have another question for oh you, <laughs> which is uh, about the Indian approach. I mean, they're now on the way to having 600 million biometric IDs, and they're going to use that for online services as well as for voting and, and uh, real-time, you know, real-life uh, applications. Have you looked at those? At that example is that something that uh, other countries, particularly developing countries, should follow? Um, I, I think that's a, a very interesting example, and we talked about it quite a bit last year with some Indian uh, delegates at, um, at Baku. Um, it is, uh, biometrics, uh, in my opinion, are a very good way of asserting identity. For instance, I use my fingerprint to get into my laptop. I feel it's a quicker, safer, more secure way uh, than, than just typing in a password. Um, uh, they are having problems with that because, as probably most of you are aware, it was initially brought in for doing more secure rural payments and making sure they actually got the right recipients. But a fingerprint um, is not necessarily a very good thing with the farming community who may uh, not have very good fingerprints, maybe cutting their hands, and, and it doesn't necessarily work all the time. But it has apparently improved the flow of money to the intended recipient. So I think it's very good. Um, in New Zealand, they're now taking the DNA of uh, people when they're born to associate it with their identity. Now, that is a very secure way of associating it with your identity. But again, how you use it really depends on um, what uh, you are trying to achieve. I think governments in particular want to make sure particularly money that they're giving to their citizens, goes to the right person. And so they want a very great certainty of identity. Um, in other situations, you don't actually need to know that it's the biological person. You need to know it's the person you saw before or the person who deposited the money in the bank. Um, although banks internationally have um, a, a requirement to know their customer. And we all know that various banks have been find a lot of money because people have suggested that they're channeling money to terrorists because they apparently didn't know their customer. So it can be, it can be very different. And I think, as Ki Chang said, it's a question of um, the right identity provision for the right service. I would like to um, say one thing about using biometric data for identity purpose. Um, I feel that one should approach with great deal of caution uh, regarding state-managed identity uh, being used in the internet. That is one thing I want to say. Another thing is uh, particularly using biometric data. Um, if your password is used to identify you, and your password is somehow leaked, you can simply reset your password. But biometric data, when it's leaked and it's in the bad hands, 
it's going to be very difficult to reset it. Uh, maybe fingerprints, you, I don't know. Uh, you have 10 fingers, so you use second finger if you, <laughs> uh, if you use DNA. Uh, I think it's going to be even more difficult to reset. And I think um, people tend to have overconfidence about biometric being very secure. But I would like to give a word of warning that it will create far more difficult problem if you just jump at biometric data. to agree with Ki Chang on this uh, completely. Um, with the, uh, the European passport, we now have biometrics in it. We have fingerprints in the European passport. Um, we did a lot of research on, on this. Uh, the trouble is that uh, companies and governments keep trying to do things on the cheap. Um, they don't do things properly the first time. Um, now, India's actually done a really good job uh, with their system. They didn't expect it to be perfect. They wanted it to improve the situation and it's gone a, a long way to improving the situation. Um, storage and protection of biometrics is fundamentally important to uh, making sure that the systems work. Um, now, use of things like uh, ID cards and that on the internet and, and if you use the Indian model, um, it's a very, uh, a very good uh, model to, to work from. One example we had was in the UK at the moment, if you want to get into a nightclub, um, we've got people showing their passports, their driving licenses. Um, on average, we get about 300 passports uh, a month that are left in nightclubs um, because people forget to take them home. Uh, or lose them, but you've got this real problem that the UK driving license has your address on it and your date of birth and your name. Um, so you've got young girls, um, you know, trying to prove that they're over 21, showing their driving license to bouncers, and the bouncer now knows their name, their date of birth, and their address. Um, if you've got a, a secure form of identity, like an identity card. They can put it into the reader, put their fingerprint on, green light, they're over 21, red light, they're under 21. Bouncer has no other information other than what he needs to let them through the door. Um, and it's the same on the internet. If you, if you can have um, electronic identity in some form of token um, using PKI, and I'm, I'm sure this is something Key Chang and I uh, will get onto, um, if you have a, a properly implemented PKI, um, you can have secure online identity uh, and you can only reveal the personal information necessary to do a particular transaction. And I think that's the way we need to go, is, is um, actually having some form of secure online identity that doesn't use static credentials. I think that's right. I think what we're starting to see in services um, like Facebook, and actually Apple's probably leading the way on this with their new fingerprint ideas, how, how you merge the technology that's out there with biometric data and the safeguards that need to go on top of use of biometric data. Um, I, and I, I was talking with our security team when the Apple announcement was made, and their, their vision was quite different. They said a, a fingerprint is... Um, it's great, it's a great innovation, but that you should think of that as your username, not as your password. That's, and uh, I think immediately after Apple announced that, there was um, a group of researchers who showed that you could effectively fake fi fingerprints or utilize um, uh, insecure data to, to get access. So I think part of, um, I think there's a lot of caution before we start to integrate the two. I also think once you start sharing biometric data, um, the responsibilities on providers like Facebook and others for that type of data has to be significant, that the bar has to be very high. Thank you. Yes? Uh, hi, my name's uh, Manu Sporni. I'm the chair of the Web Payments Group uh, at the World Wide Web Consortium. We also deal quite a bit with identity and security. Uh, also work with uh, the Mozilla Persona team. We're building a new identity mechanism directly into the browser. 
um, 425 million people are going to have access to that identity mechanism. And one of the things that really concerns us is that we don't have a lot of government in, uh, involvement, meaning uh, if you look down the participant list uh, at the IGF, uh, very few, if any, of the folks at the IGF are actually involved in the creation of these standards. So the question is, how do we get more of these stakeholders um, involved with the technology companies that are actually building these solutions? Um. Well, I wish I had a, a, an answer to that because um, uh, certainly since we've been coming to the IGF, we've been saying that there's not necessarily the right balance of stakeholders here to deal with, with all the different problems. But I do think uh, my own personal view is that there's never going to be some big universal solution. We're going to have appropriate solutions for different classes of transactions and uh, people will have different identities, different levels of security that they need for doing different things. And I think there are already some quite good federated ID schemes, uh, particularly in international banking. Um, there are increasingly some uh, uh, used by the mobile phone companies. There are others used internationally by uh, social networks and so on, um, by um, uh, companies uh, buying and selling on the internet because these people have needed to reduce fraud, so I think uh, there's a great driver there, and I don't think government involvement is necessarily helpful, uh, because not every citizen wants their government to also know <laughs> everything else that they're doing o o online. Uh, do other others have a, a I guess my, my concern was uh, a bit more specific than that. The, there are tech, uh, so I agree with the whole you know, multi-level security, multi-level identity thing. In fact, that's a lot of the technology that we're building. The, the concern here is that this technology is being built right now. It is going into devices. It's, you know, Mozilla's gonna be build it into their web browser and once that's done, 425 million people at, at the very least are gonna have access to it. Mozilla's next version, uh, you know, their, their next generation mobile phone called Firefox OS is going to have identity built into it uh, from the core. So the, the concern here is that the, the concerns that you are raising, uh, while the group pays attention to them and is trying to build an identity solution that, that um, takes those things into account, we don't have anybody else in the group kind of beating the drum on the, on the you know, multi-level identity uh, security aspects of it, the government-issued ID aspects of it. Like I said, I chair the web payments group, so know your customer uh, information is really important, AML information is really important. So while I, I do agree that there will be multiple different types of solutions, the concern here is that the general solution for the public, the, the, the thing that you're going to use to log into a website in the future, we're not getting very much input from uh, you know, uh, governments or um, other, other organizations like that. And really, we need that kind of, kind of input. We need someone looking out for the citizens saying, you know, we need multi-level security um, in, in the general solution. I, I'd, I'd agree. Um, and you tend to find, like, with the International Standards Organization, uh, British Standards Institution, etc., you do have uh, government representation uh, on all of the working groups. Um, so all of the stuff, I, I, I'm the BCS representative on the ISO panel that does 27001 and all the 27000 series and the security standard. On that, we also have um, representatives from different government departments. Um, and on the, the working group five, which is uh, identity and privacy, we, we even have like GCHQ, uh, Home Office, we, we've got uh, a lot of government representation. Um, there's government representation in the OASIS group uh, and in some of the others, but you're right, there, there are certain areas where government involvement is lacking. And I, you know, it's, we're trying to come to things like this uh, to improve that. Um. Actually, at this point, I'd like to go on to the second half of our discussion because I know Ki Chang is, is going to cover that in what he's about to uh, speak about. And then we'll take further questions after the next two short presentations. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I, I can. Uh, yeah, it should be okay. Um, th that very question was something I wanted to talk about today. Uh, I'm from uh, OpenNet Korea. And actually, after this session, in the second uh, segment of uh, sessions, we have a op open forum where op what OpenNet Korea does and all that. And I would like to ask Ahir if you could just go to the next slide. Um, South Korea has had an experience of enforcing uh, state-managed offline identity regime on online. Uh, 2007, South Korean government introduced a legislation which required uh, internet users to identify themselves if they want to put a posting on the website, certain websites, certain very popular websites. Um, so if you want to reply to some kind of newspaper uh, article on the internet, you have to identify yourself. So what kind of identity regime you are going to use? Uh, government wanted to use something familiar to them, which is national identity regime, uh, citizen's registration number. So that is uh, a very early precautious attempt to use and enforce identity in the internet. Uh, that created a huge problem, and I want to take this opportunity to, to warn uh, the dangers involved in jumping at identity regime in a very light-hearted manner. Uh, the first topic is national identity regime in the internet. Does that really make sense? Uh, what happened to Korea when government required internet users to identify themselves using Korean national identity regime that basically insulated internet in Korea as some sort of intranet where foreigners had enormous difficulty using Korean website. Of course, foreigners resident in Korea can use their alien registration number to identify themselves. But then what about foreigners not living in Korea who knows who know Korean language and who want to reply to some of the discussions about Korean issues, they simply cannot use the website. Do you really want that? Do you want your internet to be kind of walled and insulated from the rest of the world? Um, and then secondly, uh, you need to be more, you need to have more nuanced approach about the whole identity issue. This is not a, a, a game where one stakeholder can give authoritative identity tokens, give out identity tokens, and then the things ha uh, will be resolved. No, it will not be resolved. There are many stakeholders and players, like governments, service providers, and users, and I think you need to have far more careful approach. You should not be quick-tempered, you should have patience and you should allow a bit of messiness there. If you want to tidy up the whole matter in a very drastic measure, I think you will encounter intractable problem in no time. Um, one needs to think, rethink and perhaps think from a completely different uh, starting point regarding online identity. In the offline world, the, the structure about identity is there is some entity which verifies your identity and then the users or the parties of online transaction uses that information. That is usual model. Uh, so the verification is some sort of one point action, one off action. So if a government agency verifies your identity or your birth certificate or driving license, s whatever is considered to be reliable or authoritative uh, information, you just take that and then the rest is how to ensure safe continuity in uh, online. 
that's perhaps uh, the habitual way of thinking. And I think it's going to be very difficult to uh, use that model in a very wide range of service. There are many areas of services which that so where that sort of approach simply does not work. And then we perhaps need to think and accept online identity growing over time or forming over time or accumulating over time uh, purely on the internet where no authoritative verifier exerts any power or any special privileged position, but just a number of service providers just using users' identity or whatever personal information for their own service. But then over time, many such service providers' uh, information can accumulate and uh, there can be born your true online identity. It might be very different from your offline identity, but it could be a workable online identity formed over time. For one example, age verification would be very uh, important issue, but very difficult issue because uh, for services like Facebook or service which aims at global market, you cannot rely on one particular government's authoritative uh, statement about a user's age, right? But then how are you going to come up with this age verification? But maybe in 10 years time, we can use how long you have been using a particular or a, 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 a series of online services. How long you have been a member of Yahoo, for example, if Yahoo still in in business in 10 years time. <laughs> but anyway, um, regarding, you can make use of a number of identity providers and then a, a particular user's activities, onli online activities, and you can aggregate them. And then that could give you a quite workable indication of your age without knowing your offline identity. Just one example. And then another issue is that you need to, we need to um, distinguish when identity matters and for why it matters and where it matters. We should not assume that identity is just one unilateral monolithic concept. It can be very diverse, fluid concept. And depending on whether you talk about prevention of crime, uh, prevention of online fraud, uh, whether you talk about protection of minor uh, from adult-oriented material. The goals are different and the level of assurance are bound to be different and the context of use is also going to be different. Therefore, the, the identity regime or identity management structure, that should also be different. and we should be very wary of uh, using offline and especially government managed identity regime on the on online world. And South Korean experiment, which was started in 2007, has been very fiercely challenged by uh, various uh, human rights group because we felt that first, in order to use an identity regime which is workable for every citizen, it has to be very easy to use. You cannot think about using PKI, for example, for just posting some kind of, some replies on the internet. It would be too cumbersome and it would be too elaborate. It would be just overkill. So governments used simply the citizen's registration number. So you, you type in your real name and then your registration number. And that's it. That's the identity clearance uh, step on the internet. It must be very light, very simple, very easy, easy to use. But then what happens is it's so easily leaked. You know, that 
that number is so easily leaked and then it's basically some kind of public good. Anyone can grab hold of a South Korean citizen's name and uh, uh, citizen's registration number. So you simply cannot have reliable mechanism of identity verification. That has an impact of having the vast majority of citizens who have no reason to lie, they type their proper name and number and they go through this proce procedure and thereby in their mind, oh, my identity is now revealed. And that has the effect of censorship. At the same time, for those who are bound to do some bad things, they can so easily get hold of somebody else's fake identity and then use it. So it does not contribute anything towards law enforcement, but it simply uh, oppressed people's free expression. So Open Net Korea challenged this law, and last year, in 2012, Constitutional Court of South Korea declared that legislation unconstitutional. It invades, it infringes upon the basic right of anonymous expression, uh, and that legislation is now scrapped. Uh, that, I hope, can give uh, some good example about uh, using government-managed uh, or government-endorsed uh, identity regime online. So I think um, the title of the session, when you were at the Facebook, we've obviously made a value judgment around um, whether anonymity is desired. So before, I mean, if you can cast your mind back not that long ago, um, I work for a, a company that's, n that's not even 10 years old, but when you're interacting on the internet, um, I mean, we, ch we think of it as pride in Facebook. There were a lot, you know, you, could, you would interact <coughs> as, you know, Unicorn 92 or, um, you know, Blue Teddy 33. And one of the things um, that we think is fundamental to Facebook having over a, a billion uh, members is our, our real name culture. And part of that is that there, there seemed to be a desire that wasn't there for people to interact as their authentic selves on the internet. Um, and when we look at Facebook as a community, this real name policy is actually essential to, to creating an environment where people feel comfortable and secure because they, they know who they're interacting with. Now, there are some issues on, on the margins of that, but the vast majority of our users are who they say they are. They're interacting. Their online w world mirrors their offline world. Um, and we believe, you know, that this is something that is very much desired and, and a need that wasn't previously being addressed. I think there are challenges when you operate under a, a real name um, policy and, and benefits. So I'll, I'll start with a positive before going to a negative. But um, there was a recent study out of the University of Kent that found that uh, compared comments on similar news articles uh, that were on posted on the Washington Post website or posted on Facebook. And the study basically found that less than half of those comments on Facebook were as uncivil as the comments on the Washington Post. And I think part of that is when you create a real name culture, when you're not operating anonymously, there's a layer of accountability that isn't, that isn't there when you're anonymous. Um, and what we've tried to do is innovate on that concept. So uh, a few years ago, we convened um, a group of academics to talk to us about how we can improve the site, um, particularly around the issues of, of cyberbullying and uh, protection of minors. And what these academics recommended is using this real name culture to address cyberbullying issues. So previously, the way that we were operating is that if there was content on Facebook that you found personally offensive, so not something so terrible that it, it violated our, our statement of rights and responsibilities, but um, if someone, you know, 
says something that, that you didn't want on Facebook, but it wasn't something you had posted so that you had direct control. Uh, you could report that. That would go to our team. It would be assessed according to the, the Statement of Rights and Responsibilities and our community standards. And effectively, a, a third party, what a Facebook third party, would sit in judgment of that content. And what the academics recommended is, why aren't you utilising um, these real people, these real that are using the site, to resolve these issues themselves? So we developed a social reporting flow. I'm not sure how many of you are, are on Facebook or uh, use it, but basically on every page, on it, on every piece of content, there's the ability to report the content. And you can report it for whatever reason. Uh, what this innovation did was it, it then, you have the choice, it can either continue to go to the, the back-end Facebook user operations team, but it also gave you um, the ability to contact the real person who had posted that information. Um, and it essentially made them accountable for it. We found that, uh, tested this a, a lot, and we found that people didn't want to just broach the issue themselves. They didn't want to say, hi, I really think that photo makes me look ugly or um, that it's offensive to me to be seen with your cat or whatever it is that was the issue. Um, and so we gave, uh, we developed a series of prompts. Um, you can still write, <laughs> write your own message directly, but there's a series of um, five or six things that you can do. So you essentially tick the box and then that goes to the other real person and what we found was, in, in a, in a, we were kind of startled by the success of it. In around 80% of the time, the person on receiving the social reporting notification would remove that content. They were unaware that it was offensive, they couldn't afford about it from the other person's perspective, or when someone raises it as an issue, as a real person, they felt compelled to take it down. I think part of, um, part of the reason I discuss that is I think once you're operating on a, in a real, uh, real name basis, once you're not anonymous, that accountability has has real impact, and it lifts the community um, that that you are part of. I'm happy to talk about other facets of uh, real name culture versus anonymity, but I wanted to give you a few tangible examples of of how we think about it at Facebook and, and where we're trying to innovate. Um, I think, uh, I'm sure other people on the panel can address the benefits of anonymity and, and we see those and we certainly think that it's not a case that in all situations <coughs> real name culture is, is desired or there are, um, there are definitely still you know, places for anonymity um, but the importance of having a choice and having a choice of platform and making sure that when you, you make that choice, not only are you accountable but also the systems that Facebook or um, Google or whatever else put in place, that they also mirror that. So we have a responsibility to be accountable, to be trans uh, transparent, and to give uh, users control. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'd just like to introduce uh, Professor Hong Zhu from uh, Professor of Law at, Chi at Beijing Normal University, who has joined us from her other panel now. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hong. Uh, thank you so much. Well, this is really uh, nice to following our friend from Korea and, and from Facebook. Uh, what I'm talking about is relevant to both of them. <laughs> uh, I want to talk, uh, give a very short one, on the real name system in China, since we talk about identity <laughs> on the internet. Uh, it is an, um, it nice to know that uh, Korean constitutional court ruled that a uh, real name law is unconstitutional in 2012. But the real name system in China uh, is very much legitimate and expanding its implementation. Um, well, let's look at real name system from two perspectives. One for those uh, internet information service provider, uh, this uh, we, we call double IS. Uh, the internet information service provider, this is definition defined by a law enacted in 2000 by state council. It's still the, the most fundamental law on all the information uh, services offered on the internet. Uh, if you want to offer any public information services on the internet in China, you have to provide your real name information. That is absolute and, and uh, uncompromisable requirement for all the information provider. You want to register the website, you must provide your photo ID 
and take a photo actually <laughs> as, a, uh, as a government agency requires. So there's one perspective. Uh, the, the, the logic behind this is that you are making information available to the public. Uh, you should make yourself available to the government and very much identifiable. This is one perspective. Another one is on internet user. I guess it's more controversial and it's very rent to the Korean system. Actually, China learn very much from the Korean <laughs> real name system. <laughs> and I use that as example. This is the international uh, practices. This is not alone in China. Uh, but the China's um, real name uh, system, there's uh, two parts. They are relevant, but not really the same. One part is really the real name registration. It is applying in telecom industry and also internet access services. For example, you want to apply for a fixed line telephone or you want to apply for mobile phone services, you must provide your uh, passport, ID card, your real identity. Uh, you want to apply for uh, internet access, you need to register your ID card with your access provider. That strict requirements must be complying. Uh, there are other circumstances that become interesting. That's how to handle with in, in internet content provider. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the blogging and the microblogging in China. Like internet is really the paradise of information flow. It's very hard to uh, filter, control, and censor. Uh, so there's um, uh, really these services uh, very much uh, developing in China. Well, I guess our friend from Facebook does not need to concern about Chinese legal requirements. It's not accessible in China at all. <laughs> 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 right. Uh, and, and, uh, well, uh, to my understanding, this is not a very strict real name system. You want to open an account for the Weibo, that's microblogging, the Chinese Twittering system, because Twitter is also blocked. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you, you have to register with your real name, but uh, the real name could not be could not be showed on your account. You could use a, 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 a pseudo name, but it must be verifiable. So the issue for this content service provider, they they must verify the real identity of all their users. This is their legal obligation. Uh, but this kind of a, a pseudo name on the interface, uh, but a real name verification system at a service provider. If the service provider fail to verify the user, uh, they will subject to legal liability. You know, in the summer, the very much keyword on all the Chinese media is the big we's. Well, come on, it's not we for vendetta, <laughs> it's we for verification. If those verifying the uh, uh, Weibo account holders, uh, they're in big trouble. They're posting something that's really not uh, 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 complying with the law, so they've been subject to legal punishment. Since it's verified, it's easy to identify them. Uh, now the question, uh, this is my final remarks. I know in Europe, this recent uh, court decision from, from the Human Rights Court, uh, that is the anonymous posting or anonymous poster at a blogging system should be allowed. So these people wouldn't be feared for the crime of defamation. I guess that's very <laughs> important for the information flow and free expression. Uh, so we, we put a question mark of the real name system and, uh, and look at uh, in the whole international perspective. So that's what it takes. Thank you very much, Hong. I know that Ki Chang would like to come back on that so we can have a yeah, um, there was a slide on anonymity. Uh, Andy, could I go back to my two slides sections? Yeah, that, that one, that one. Um, it seems that uh, what Facebook does and what Chinese government does on a superficial level are more or less the same. <laughs> they require, well, um, Facebook does not require, but users almost always voluntarily put up their photo, all right? And then many Facebook users use their real name. So you have real name and your photo all available. Chinese government perhaps require and you have your photo somehow available and your real name available. But I think 
they are two drastically different uh, uh, situations. And obviously, the big difference is uh, Facebook, in the case of Facebook, it is voluntary, whereas in Chinese government's uh, case, it is mandatory. But that is lawyer's talk. And I think a service like Facebook, is it really voluntary? And how long can we realistically maintain that it is vi voluntary? If you don't want to use Facebook, Twitter, or whatever of these very prevalent social networking service, you have a choice not to use it. But how long would that choice be a truly viable choice for young generation. So I think sooner or later we might have some converging issues about these two. Currently they are very different, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about anonymity uh, because both participants recognizes recognize the need for anonymity, but at the same time they emphasize the benefits of real identity. But I want to point out that there is a, a, a certain amount of ambiguity about the notion of anonymity itself. And in many cases, the very notion of anonymity is uh, deceptive and misleading because technically it is, I don't think it is possible Internet is not an anonymous medium of communication. Technically, it has always been possible to identify where is the other end, unless the other end applies a very sophisticated technology of faking its whereabouts. Uh, and then the data is always accessible anyway, unless you encrypt. But then encryption also there is a great deal of possible ways of entry if you, you know look at NSA scandal so um, what is really important is to educate people that you are really not anonymous you cannot be truly anonymous you are being watched and especially by government and also by industry the companies have motivations to watch you and get as much information from you. Government, if you are doing some naughty things, they have equally strong desire to look at what you are doing and study and learn about you. So uh, internet just opens that possibility to you and you are very vulnerable to it. And how to educate it to wider public and I think we must be very uh, how should I say honest about using the word anonymous or anonymity because internet is not anonymous how to uh, educate and propagate propagate the knowledge but then at the same time we should not give up the notion of privacy because in my view Privacy or privacy is something which is entirely compatible with the situation where your identity is known. You don't need anonymity to have privacy. Just one simple example, you know, at home, uh, English homes at home, they, the individual bedroom never ha seems to have locked right it's it's always uh, there is no lock and you know the identity of your son or your daughter or whatever you know there is no <laughs> anonymity there it's everybody's identity is perfectly clear you know your parents or your two kids living in a house no door has any lock but you can have privacy you know you s you observe certain rules you knock and before if someone in in the room says just a second, you wait for just a second. And that's how you achieve privacy, where everybody's identity is perfectly clearly known, still privacy is possible by observing certain rules and conventions 
and restraining exercise of your power. So I think we should never give up the idea of privacy simply because internet does not technically offer you anonymity. The real key about privacy is two things, I think. How to ensure robust control of power, control over power. Those the power can be either exercised by government or by industry. Big service providers like Facebook <laughs> or Google or whatever, they are, in my view, equally powerful and their exercise of power should also be under control. Obviously, different type of control, but government's power should also be under control. And then secondly, transparency of how that power is exercised. So as long as we can somehow find ways to achieve control and transparency about the exercise of power, I think we can still have privacy uh, in a world where everybody's identity is disclosed. That's what I believe. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions that people would like to ask or points people would like to make? Hey, um, Nicola Douglas from Childnet International. Um, I'd just like to comment on something that the professor said um, about anonymity not being possible. And I completely agree that from a governmental perspective, you know, you are not anonymous online because so much data can be found out about you. But uh, from the perspective of young people uh, using services like Twitter, which don't require your real name, um, it's not always possible to sort of for you to find out who the person is that might be, you know, who you're receiving anonymous abuse from. And, you know, it's, it's easy to say on a governmental level that that's, uh, that anonymity doesn't exist. But for us, I think it definitely does. When there are services like Ask FM, which, you know, they use anonymity for, uh, to work, as it were. Um, and just one other point. Uh, we, uh, Childnet International and the youth participants, we uh, conducted a survey um, since the summer. Um, 1,382 participants uh, from across 68 countries. And uh, from the people that we surveyed, 86% said it was important uh, that people are able to be anonymous online if they want to be. Um, and a further 59% said that they are more likely to say what they want online if they are anonymous. You can pick up a leaflet from us if you're interested. Um, uh, what I'd like to ask the panel is, do you think that there's a risk that um, although using online, online services like Facebook, which require a real name, do you think that there's a risk that it limits our freedom of expression because we're, a, we're scared of the accountability? Because young people like to experiment. We all know it's true. We probably are called on it at one point in our lives. So do you think that there's a risk that our, ex our expression is limited? Thank you. Okay. Sarah, would you like to answer that first? And then sure. I think it comes back to having a choice of platform. And it, it's also the point um, that was made at the beginning of the session, that identity is, is being used in different, in different ways in different forums. So it may be that for the things you, you don't want to have a legacy that you're going to use Snapchat. Um, or it, it may be that for something that uh, where you perceive there's some, there's some risk you use Twitter under a, a false name. But it may be where you want to interact with, you know, friends and family you use Facebook. So I don't think that there's one right platform or one right mechanism. What hopefully what's going to happen is that these, there's going to be continued innovation and continued choice and continued options, and people are going to get more savvy about their choices and their choice of forum and become more deliberate about what they're doing. Part of that is an education responsibility on on some of the platforms to explain you know, the risks and the, the benefits of, of sharing and sharing information either anonymously or, or in your real name. Um, but I don't think that there's one right answer that's going to fit for everyone. Um, technically, uh, internet is not anon anonymous. Um, the the s highly sophisticated uh, traffic uh, analyst could uh, get a lot of information about you and analyzing your IP address will give you a lot of information. So that technical impossibility of hiding uh, from the uh, scrutinizing eyes is one thing. But then 
by observing rules, you can s remain reasonably anonymous and you can remain, uh, you can have your privacy. Technically, I think it is very easy to tear apart and tear open an envelope. You know, anyone can just technically uh, just tear it open and then read it. But by sticking to rules, you don't open the envelope and then you give that envelope to the person destined and who has the right to open it. So, um, internet, uh, you can remain and you can have uh, enjoy anonymous anonymity to some degree, but to be aware that you cannot remain anonymous in the eyes of the authorities or in the eyes of uh, industries, that is important, I think. Another point about uh, internet and this sense of anonymity is the vast uh, vastly extended reachability of the internet. That user who uses uh, uh, an interesting uh, username in Twitter who just tweeted uh, something very offensive to you, that user might be at the other end of the globe. You simply don't know. In the traditional uh, communication technology, you would have no reason to hear something being spoken by someone who is that far removed from you, okay? But internet allows that. So that means the power of reaching to a much vast audience, that is uh, somehow, that gives you the sense of anonymity. Although technically you are not anonymous, you are very far removed and that other person's identity really doesn't matter to you, to the listener. So this sense of anonymity is uh, provided by the reachability of the internet. Yeah. Are there any questions from uh, remote participants? Uh, no, Louise, there is a remote participant who's uh, been chatting to me quite a lot about <laughs> what's being said. I could see that going on, but, that's uh, why. <laughs> but uh, there's been no uh, intervention yet. Okay. Are there other questions from, thank you. Uh, Misha Blackman, Australian Taxation Office, Melbourne, Australia. We've talked a lot today. Sorry, I, can, you, I, can you go a little Speak up? Yes, thank you. Sure. We've talked a lot today about strength of credentials. We've talked a lot about the technology that supports that strengthening. Um, the, the, I think the elephant maybe in the room for us a little bit is the strength of the process that's required to register that credential in the first place. So we talk, we've talked a little about three-factor authentication, um, the who you are, what you are, what you know. How, do you, how does the panel see those factors coming into a digital environment where the provision of <laughs> a passport, for example, um, is not something that's able to be matched with, with a facial recognition identity in a really secure manner? How, how do we start to progress in that thinking and start linking up third party credentials and utilising the strength of those multi-credentials and linking them to an identity to strengthen? I, th I think this is going to be one of the, the big problems. Um, today, most online identities are still based on a real world identity. Um, so if, if you want a, uh, an assured uh, online identity, it's based on registration through using your passport or driving license or some government issued identity uh, or identity document. It's incredibly difficult to do remote verification and registration of identity. Um, lots of people have tried it. There, there have been various schemes on the internet, but un unless you've got some way of uh, verifying the attributes that someone claims uh, and corroborating the evidence that they give you, it's really difficult to have any assurance in the identity and that identity belonging to the person that's claiming it. Um, identity theft is a is a real problem when it comes to things like that. And I, I think until we get to a stage where we have trusted government documents that can be uh, 
uh, queried and read uh, online, we're not going to get to a situation where we can move away from using government registered identities uh, to underpin online identities. We will see it in the future at some point, uh, once we get better use of PKI, uh, more secure PKI put in place, um, and the ability for industry and third parties to query those PKIs and have trust in the, the certificates issued by governments. But I think that's still a way away. I would like to add one more word regarding PKI, which Andy just mentioned. Uh, South Korea, again, um, <laughs> experimented and actually enforced a nationwide PKI, ma again, mandatory PKI system, where every user who intends to do financial transaction, online financial transaction, online banking, online shopping, must have government uh, endorsed PKI um, certificate, digital certificate issued to you. Uh, government thought that that would provide a very secure, very reliable identity verification for critically important transactions, online transactions. Uh, it started in the uh, 2003, 2000, between 2002 and 2003. So we have over 10 years of experiments where every user is required to present their digital certificate. In my view, in Korea, there are still a, 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 a large number of enthusiasts who advocate and who firmly believe that it works. But in my view, it's a miserable failure because it is very difficult to ensure that every user maintains that digital certificate securely. It's just a tiny little file issued to individual who most of them don't know what is computer security. And government used, again, a 